Can we give God a hand clap of praise in this place? Amen. Praise the Lord. Truly, the presence of the God is here. And truly, God has been with us today. I want to call your attention to the scriptures, to the book of 1 Chronicles, the 11th chapter. We're going to start with verse 22. We're going to read through to 24. 1 Chronicles, the 11th chapter. If you have it, would you say amen? 1 Chronicles, the 11th chapter, starting with verse 22, it says, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab, also, he went down and slew a lion in a pit in a snowy day. And he slew an Egyptian, a man of great stature, five cubits high. And in the Egyptian's hand was a spear like a weaver's beam. And he went down to him with a staff and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. These things did Benaiah the son of Jehoiada and had the name among the three mighties. Let me read it to you again in the New International Version. It says, Benaiah son of Jehoiada, a valiant fighter from Kabzeel, performed great exploits. He struck down Moab's two mightiest warriors he also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. That's enough. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come. We pray that you would speak life now. We pray that you would speak hope. We pray that you would give us meat in due season. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't intend to keep you too long today. I keep trying with you all, but y'all not learning. When I say something like that, somebody is supposed to say, take your time, Pastor. But I, I said, I'm not going to keep you too long, and everybody mumbled on their, under their breath, amen. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm not, but I really don't intend to keep you too long. In First Chronicles chapter 11, we learn of the, uh, some of David's mighty men. When David came to power, David was a military kind of king. Uh, David ensured that Israel had a strong military. After all, David had a military background. David loved to fight. And so 1 Chronicles 11 is just uh, the story of David's mightiest of men. David had three mighty men in his military, and he set those three mighty men over the rest. And then there was another class of the 30 mighty men, and those 30 ma mighty men were set over the various divisions of the military. And one of those three mighty men we read about just a while ago, his name is Benaiah. Now, Benaiah is not one of the top three. Benaiah falls in the category of the 30, uh, but Benaiah is a bad boy. Benaiah is known for three major exploits in his life, and the Bible gives it to us in 1 Chronicles 11. The first one, the Bible says, is that Benaiah went and fought against the Moabites. And the King James Version says that he fought against two lion-like men. Uh, the New International Version says that he struck down two of Moab's greatest warriors. Uh, the, 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 the truth is that that, that word that describes these uh, two foes that Benaiah fought is an obscure word that doesn't appear anywhere else. And so we don't know what in the world the word means, but, but it means that Benaiah was a bad boy because he fought against whether it was lion-like men or two of Moab's greatest warriors. He fought them and killed them. Are you all with me today? 
The second exploit that Benaiah is known for, the Bible says that Benaiah went down into a pit on a snowy day with a lion and he killed the lion. Okay, the Bible says that Benaiah went down into a pit with a lion on a snowy day and he killed the lion and walked out of the pit alive. Now, now I don't know if I could go in a pit with a pit bull and come out alive. Are you all still with the preacher out there? Uh, the third great exploit that Benaiah is known for is that he killed an Egyptian who was five cubits tall. That's seven and a half feet. He's somewhere in Goliath region. And Benaiah, he, the Bible says he has a big spear in his hand. And the Bible says that all Benaiah has is a club in his hand. And Benaiah is able to successfully use his club to get the Egyptian spear. And though the Egyptian was a giant, Benaiah killed the Egyptian with his own spear. I, 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 if I were to look at the three foes that Benaiah faced, I, I could sum them up like this. Uh, the Moabites uh, represent uh, the enemy that we have within. You see, the Moabites and the Israelites were really cousins, if you will, because if you remember way back in Genesis when Lot's daughters got him pregnant, uh, they gave birth to two sons, one by the name of Amnon, who became the father of, of, of the Ammonites and, 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 and I believe uh, the city of Amnon Jordan today is named in his honor and the other one is, is the father of the Moabites. His name is Moab and this is now Lot's son Moab has come and his nations have, 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 have expanded and the Ammonites and the, the Moabites rather and the Israelites are enemies but they're really relatives. Are you all still with the preacher today? And some of the enemies that we face are really a part of us. Some of the enemies that we face are the enemies within. Some people say that they are their own worst critic. Isn't that truth that sometimes the greatest enemy is not the enemy outside. Sometimes the greatest enemy is the enemy within. Sometimes the greatest enemy is fighting the fleshly desires that are part of us. Sometimes the greatest enemy is the desire to cut. Sometimes the greatest enemy is the desire to flip somebody the bird. Sometimes the greatest enemy is not the enemy that attacks us from without, but it's the enemy within. Uh, there is one preacher that says there are two beasts within me and they wrestle for control of my life. One is good and the other one is evil. And the question is, which beast wins the most? The one that you feed the most. The truth is that all of us have two beasts within us. Within every one of us is the capacity to be the most vile, wicked, rude, and crude person. And within every one of us is the capacity to be a servant of the most high God and the decision as to whether you you're going to be jacked up or saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost is simply based upon what you feed the most. If you feed the attitude the most, you're going to be an attitudinal somebody. If you feed the spirit the most, you're going to be a spiritual somebody. And I want to encourage you to feed the spirit. Come on and say amen. So, so the first enemy that 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 uh, that that he fights is is the enemy within. Uh, but 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 Benaiah not only fights the enemy within, uh, but the Bible says that Benaiah fights with the Egyptian. Now I want you to understand that the Egyptians, thank you, Elder Mace, the Egyptians were were still at, at this time the crown jewel of the world. Uh, the Egyptians were the ones who were sophisticated. The, the Egyptians were the one who, who had uh, uh, the model for uh, a society. Uh, some of the Israelites will complain that they wanted to go back to Egypt. They, they, they no longer remember the brutal beatings of Egypt. They, they no longer remember the, the fact that they had to make brick without straw. They no longer remember the oppression and, and the subjugation that they experienced in Egypt, but, but they remember the luxuries of Egypt. They remember the nice trees, the pleasant trees. They, they remembered all all of the, 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 the nice and beautiful things that there were to behold and experience in Egypt. Egypt was the world standard at this time. And so uh, Benaiah slays an Egyptian 
and I see the second enemy that most of us have to deal with is the enemy of secularization, uh, the, the enemy of the world and the things of the world. Not only do we deal with the enemy within, but we deal with the world and the desire to be more like the world. Every one of us every day faces pressure to be more like the world. We face pressure to impress people with material things. We face pressure to be prosperous and to live out the American dream, whatever that really is. We face pressure to drive the fanciest car, have the fanciest of bags. We face pressure to make sure that the bottom of our shoes are, are red and that they're no other color. We face pressure to, to fit in and, and pressure to be like everybody else. We face pressure. Worldliness and secularization pushes on us, and we experience the pressure. Oh, my brothers and sisters, you can have the same bag made in the same factory. One says Michael Kors, and they sell it for hundreds of dollars. The other one has a fake Michael Kors symbol on it, and they sell it on Canal Street for $20. And we face this secularization and this push to fit in and be like everybody else. And the problem is, not so much with material things, but the problem is when our spiritual views are informed by secularization. When our spiritual views start to be informed by the world. When we start to see religion as just mythology. That's the problem. Why are you all so quiet on the preacher in here? When you, are, when you can trust more in the concept of evolution than you can in the concept of creation, though creation is found in the word of God and evolution is not. When you can begin to put your trust in, in, the, in, in, in your own understanding, uh, that is where the problem comes in. My brothers and sisters, I fully confess that there are things that I do not understand and there are things that I will never be able to explain, but it's true. Bible says that I should trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not unto my own understanding. In all my ways acknowledge him and he will direct my path. You may say that I sound ignorant. You may say that I sound like a country bumpkin, but I'm going to put my trust in the word of the Lord because God has never failed me yet. He has never left me nor forsaken me. In my deepest and darkest moments of despair, grief, and sorrow, God was right there. In sickness, he was there. In pain, he was there. And when I was burying my mother, he was there. When some of you were diagnosed with terrible illnesses, he was there. He has never left you nor forsaken you. You can put your trust in God. He has never written you a check that, was, that bounced. He has never given you a promise that he did not keep. The Bible says that God is not slack concerning his promises. As some men count slackness. Aren't you glad that we don't serve a God that makes promises and doesn't keep them? But every single promise that God has made, he has kept everything he said he was going to do. He has done. He has given us prophecy and it has come to pass. I trust the word of God. So many of us have gone into the world and we have been corrupted by our own understanding. And the truth is, if you could understand God, then he would no longer be God. Yeah, let me try to say that one more time. If you could understand God, then he wouldn't be God. Because our finite understanding cannot comprehend an infinite God. And if I had a grasp on this infinite God, then he wouldn't really be God because I have a grasp on him. The Bible says, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts, which means that God is mysterious. As a matter of fact, the old folk used to say God works in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform. There is an element of mystery when it comes to God. I can't explain it. I can't quantify it. I can't measure it. I can't put it in words because it is God. Some of us face not only the enemy within, but the enemy of secularization is pushing on us, and we experience that enemy. The third enemy that I want to talk about today is the enemy that Benaiah experienced and might be most infamous for. The Bible says that Benaiah came upon a lion, and he went down into a pit with a lion on a snowy day, 
and he slew the lion. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is really interesting because the lion is what they used to call, when I was a boy, they used to call it the king of the jungle. We've become a little more sophisticated because we realize lions don't live in jungles. So now I recognize that the lion is the king of beasts. Are you all still with me out there? There's no animal quite as powerful or that I regard as powerful or as highly as the lion. They say that a lion has so much power in his paw that if a lion were to slap the human skull, that the skull of the human after being slapped by the lion's paw would crumble as a human could crumble an egg in their hands. Lions are powerful beasts. The thing about, thing about lions is that, that, that lions are, are hunters, and so uh, when, a, when a lion is about to pounce, uh, most times the prey doesn't even know that the lion is in their vicinity. The lion is stealthy. The lion sneaks up on you. And then the attack is sudden, it's brutal, it's fierce, and it can be fatal. I wonder if there's anybody here today that's dealing with a lion in their life. Something that you could not have predicted. Uh, let's talk about that enemy. We, we talked about the enemy within, and we, we talked about the enemy from without. But, 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 but we have those lions in our lives. By and large, we can predict the stuff that's going on within. Uh, we know what our family's downfalls have been, and we know what our proclivities are, and we understand our characteristics and our, and our habits. We can kind of predict what's going on within, and we kind of know what's up with the world, and we kind of know where the world is pushing us. But the lions are so unpredictable. The, the, these lions, they, they, they come upon us, these, these problems, these enemies, these foes, uh, they come upon us and, and we could not have predicted them until the onset is sudden. Uh, uh, but, but not only is it sudden, but it's fierce, brutal. I mean, I, mean, I wonder if there's somebody here that, that feels like they're in the fight of their life. I wonder if there's anybody here that, that's dealing with a lion and, and, and you, you, you're looking at this lion and you're wondering if you're going to even survive this thing. I wonder if there's anybody here that's facing a problem that is so devastating that you really have questions as to whether you're going to weather the storm. I mean, you've been through some stuff before, but maybe this one is going to take you out. I mean, some real fierce, brutal lions. Think about lions, they're, they're powerful. Not only they're powerful, but they're relentless. Lions don't give up. Why y'all so quiet on the preacher in here? Lions don't give up. If you punch a lion in the eye, he's not going to turn around and run away. A lion is not like a dog. You can hit him on his nose and suddenly he becomes weak. Lions are ferocious and, and they don't give up. They're so powerful. They say that the jaw of a lion, if a lion were to clamp down on any human bone, even the thigh bone, they could snap it in two. It's powerful. It's fierce. It's brutal. It doesn't give up. I wonder if there's anybody dealing with a lion. And the jacked up thing about what Benaiah had to deal with, he, he dealt with the worst possible foe in the worst possible place. The Bible says he went down into a pit with a lion. Now, brothers and sisters, there's no good place to fight a lion. Are you all with me out there? There's really no ideal circumstance under which to fight a lion. But there are some circumstances that are worse than others. Are you all still with me? And if I had my choice, I'd rather fight a lion in a place where I could at least attempt fleeing than to fight a lion in a pit where there is no escaping the might and the power of the lion. Are you all still with me? At least if I'm, in, if I'm in the open, I could try running and hopefully because I have Jamaican blood, I can tap into the inner Usain Bolt and hopefully I could outrun the lion. I, 
I mean, if I have to fight a lion, I, I would like to fight a lion at a place where there's access to like an armored car or something like that, where I can run into the armored car and the lion's paw would not be able to smash the windows. Why are you all so quiet on me? I mean, I'm, I'm talking, if I had to choose a place to fight a lion, I don't know if lions can climb trees, but I would want to be in a place where I could try to climb a tree and escape the lion. I mean, there's no real ideal place to fight a lion, but there are certainly less ideal places than others. Benaiah goes down to fight a lion in a pit. I'm wondering if there's anybody who is here who is dealing with a lion in their life and you feel like the lion has showed up at the worst possible place. I mean, it's like fighting something that's life-limiting and it's in your body. I mean, it's like dealing with cancer. I mean, you're trying to fight it, but the thing is attacking your body. It's like the worst possible place. It's like, it's like you lose your job and you're going through marital stress. I mean, it's like things are just not, it's, it's, it's just one thing on top, the worst possible timing. Have you ever been there? I mean, you're broke, and that's when the car breaks down. I mean, have you ever been there? I mean, you're broken emotionally, and that's when a family member dies. I mean, have you ever been there where one person died right after the other person, and you're saying, I just spent everything that I had, emotional, physical, financial, I gave it everything. I mean, have you ever been there where you are tired, and you come home, and that's when she wants to quarrel. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I mean, th 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 there's no good time to fight a lion. But sometimes are less ideal, sometimes and places are less ideal than others. So Benaiah is really set up because he's fighting a lion and he's fighting in a pit. It reminds me of Daniel in the lion's den except these lions' mouth are not shut. The Bible says that this lion's mouth is open and he's ready to kill Benaiah, but one more thing complicates it. And we all dealt with it today. The Bible says it was a snowy day. My goodness. I mean, what is Murphy's Law? Anything that can go wrong will go wrong at the worst possible time. Is that how it goes? Something like that. Yeah. The Benaiah is in a pit with a lion on a snowy day. Now, I had to go shovel the snow today. Let me tell you what I know about snow. I know that snow can be slippery in and of itself. I learned that when snow is compacted, it becomes even more slippery. So when you step on the snow and pound on it a little bit, it's even more. It's like ice under your feet. So Benaiah is fighting with a lion on a slowy day when it's slippery, but this is what I experienced today. I don't know if anybody else experienced it. I opened my garage door to look out at my driveway filled with snow. The garage was dark, and as I lifted the, drive, the garage door, the light of the sun hitting the snow was blinding. The snow is so bright, it takes the eyes a while to adjust. I can imagine being outside in an area that is filled with snow, nothing to see but snow, and the sun is shining on it. It is blinding. So not only is it slippery, but the man can't see. And that's if it's done snowing. If it's still snowing, the snow impedes his vision even further. And if there are blizzard types of, 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 of wind, it can be a whiteout where the man can't even see the lion that he's facing. Are you all with me out there? Have you, have, have you, I'm wondering if there's anybody that's going through that. You're dealing with your lion. You're in the pit with a lion. And it's like it's a snowy day. And you just feel like everything is stacked against you. Kind of cornered. Like you can't win. Like there's no way out. If you've never been there, 
May I suggest to you to prepare because one day you may just end up there. But what do you do when you're in a pit with a lion on a snowy day? Well, I guess the only, you, there are only two options. Either you can sit there and become the lion's dinner, or you can say to yourself, I'm going to kill this lion. Now, now Benaiah went down in the lion in the in the pit with the lion, and, and we already know that Benaiah is a valiant man. The Bible says that Benaiah has killed lion-like men before, and the Bible says that Benaiah has killed giants before. And so Benaiah may have been thinking to himself, uh, "All that I've ever experienced in my life has prepared me for this fight, which is the fight of my life." I don't know who I'm preaching to in here today but somebody may be in the fight of their life and you need to just reflect on the fights you've been through before. Remember you've been to the cemetery before. Remember you were diagnosed with something before. Remember you had pain before. Remember there was upheaval in your life before and every fight you have been through has prepared you for this fight. You were just in training for what you're about to deal with right now and if you could do with it then, you can do it now. And if God helped you then, he can help you. Now, my Bible says that he is the same today as he was yesterday, which means if he could bring me through hell 10 years ago, he could bring me through hell right now. If he could bring me through a divorce back then, he could carry me right now. If he could bring me through cancer the first time, he can bring me through cancer the second time. If he opened a door before, he can open another door. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that when he he opens a door. No man can shut the door. And when he shuts the door, no man can open the door. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. So, Brother Benaiah must have said, everything I've been through has prepared me for this fight that I'm about to be in right now. But, 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 but. Uh, see, when I read the text, and this is why reading the text is important, I re realized that, that Benaiah's name is never mentioned without his father's name. The Bible says Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada. And so I said, well, what does Jehoiada mean? And Jehoiada means the Lord knows. So I said, well, what does Benaiah mean? Benaiah means the Lord built. And so if you put them together, uh, that's your key to getting out of whatever you're dealing with. The Lord knows and the Lord builds. See, Benaiah could rest comfortably knowing that when he was in that pit with the lion on the snowy day, that he wasn't there all by himself, but the Lord knew exactly what he was going through. And I am so glad that I serve a God who knows exactly where I am and what I am going through, but not only does he know where I am, am and what I'm experiencing, but he knows how to bring me out. My Bible tells me that he knows how to make a way out of no way. I'm so glad that I'm still in the knowledge of God, that God still knows about me. He knows about my pain. He knows about my kids. He knows about my family. God knows about my job. I'm glad God still knows. But not only does he know, but God builds. I wish somebody knew what I was talking about. So, so God knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what you're dealing with. But God knows how to build some stuff. Uh, that's why the Bible says that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purposes because God knows how to build something out of nothing. I wish I had a church in here that understood the power of God building uh, because one day God stepped out into nowhere and looked at nothing and he he spoke to nothing and nothing became everything and nowhere became everywhere. Don't tell me that God doesn't know how to build because Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. Don't tell me that God doesn't know how to build. He says, uh, uh, he says, I have gone to prepare a place for you and if I go again and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. I'm so glad that God knows uh, but God always 
also builds. And so I just believe that God is going to build me up right now. I believe that God is going to build a way out of no way. That God will build a fence. That God will build a barrier. That God will build some stairs. That God will build a door. That God will build a... I just believe that God can build whatever I need. God is a builder. So if you need God to work a miracle today, God can build you a custom miracle. He can build a defense. Whatever you need, God can build. So the Bible says Benaiah is in this pit on a snowy day with a lion. And I don't know how he does it. Walks out alive. I just want to prophesy over somebody in here today. You can kill the lion and you can walk out alive. As a matter of fact, you're going to kill the lion and you're going to walk out alive. If you're that person, would you come to the altar? I want to pray for you. You're dealing with the lion right now and you just need the presence of God to help you to kill the lion. Would you come on to the altar? You're dealing with that lion. Come on now, come now, come now. Come quickly. I know that you're there. Come, you're dealing with the lion. Come on to the altar. I don't know what your lion is, but come on to the altar. Let's pray together. says he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Is there somebody today saying pastor I want to be baptized? If that's you would you raise your hand towards heaven now? Nobody's watching you. This is your moment. Would you raise your hand towards heaven right now? You want to be baptized. Praise the Lord. We're praying. Heavenly Father we come to the altar today because there's some lions in our lives. God we come to the altar because we're dealing with some lions. God some of us are dealing with the lion of illness and disease God. We come to the altar because it's frightening. Yeah, we have faith, God, but we're still afraid. We have faith, God, but, but, but there is some trepidation in our hearts. God, we have faith, but there's a part of us that doesn't know if we're going to make it. God, we come to the altar today because we're dealing with lions. We're dealing with lions of pain in our body. We're dealing with lions of emotional turmoil and distress. We're dealing with lions of marital problems and, 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 and financial problems. God, we're dealing with all kinds of lions in this place today. God, we're dealing with lions of, of, of unemployment and underemployment. God, we're dealing with lions finding, creating barriers in our way. God, some of us are trying to go back to school. Some of us want to go to school, God, but, but the lions keep on showing up. God, somebody wants to have a baby, but the lions keep on showing up. God, somebody is just looking to live free, God, but the lions keep showing up. Somebody couldn't sleep last night because when they put their head down, God, they, all they could do is think of the lion in their life. But God, in the name of Jesus, we come to you today believing that you are the God that can cause lions to flee. We come to you today, God, because we still believe that you are the God who can shut lions' mouths. 
We see how you shut the mouth of a lion in Daniel's story. We see how you gave Benayim uh, of the, the victory over the lion. And so, God, we just pray that you would help us to have the victory over these lions in our lives. God, we come today claiming your promise that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. God, we want victory over the lions of our experience. God, we want victory over the lions of our pain and our heartache. God, we come today because we need victory victory God we need release from these lions these lions are frightening us these lions are scaring us God these lions are roaring at us these lions are ferocious and relentless but we serve a God that is more powerful than any lion we serve a God that is more relentless than any foe and so we come to you God and we ask that you would say to us like you said to Moses and the children of Israel stand still and see the salvation of the Lord because the enemies that you see today you will never see again for the rest of your life. God, we pray that you would fight against our foes, fight against our enemies, and God, we pray that you would cause our enemies to flee. We pray that all we would have to do is stand still and look upon Jesus and see our enemies tremble and fall in the name of Jesus. We pray that you would rebuke the enemies that have come to devour us. In the name of Jesus, we claim the promise that a thousand will fall at one side and 10,000 at the other, but none shall befall us. In the name of Jesus, we claim the promise that says that we are the head and not the tail, that we are above and not beneath. God, in the name of Jesus, we appeal to your power and your might and your delivering spirit that you would turn us around, turn the situation around, turn our homes around, turn our pain around, turn our sadness into gladness. Jesus, we need you now more than we have ever needed you before. God, 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 come and deliver us from these lions. Set us free, God. There's somebody with a spirit of promiscuity. Set us free. God, there's somebody with a spirit of alcohol. Set us free. God, there's somebody with a spirit of gambling. Set us free in the name of Jesus. God, rebuke every sin, every demon, every foe. Give us liberty in the name of Jesus. And God, we look forward to that day and time where you're going to come and you're going to redeem us, where you're going to make our spirits and our bodies perfect, and we will spend the ceaseless ages of eternity in your midst. So we pray as the Apostle John prayed, even so come Lord Jesus. Now, God, we remember the tithe and the offerings that are about to be taken. We thank you for giving them to us. We thank you for increase. We pray that you would bless it, and that you would use it for the furtherance of the gospel. And God, we pray for the meal that has been prepared for all of us, that you would bless it, that you would help us to spend time in fellowship and oneness. Please, God, when we leave this place, take us to our places of abode safely. Bless every person in the house today and everybody that is at home or watching via the internet. We pray that you would bless them as well. Thank you for hearing and thank you for answering our prayers. In the mighty and majestic name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, let all of God's children say, Amen and Amen.